Um, Professor Yasaki Onoda will be the third speaker today. Professor Onoda would be the most noted architecture planner in recent Japan. He became recognized in the field after his contribution to the masterpiece of contemporary architecture Sendai Mediatek by Toyo Ito in 2001. In 2003, he received the uh, Architecture Institute of Japan Prize, which is a prestigious prize in the field of architecture in Japan for Reihoku Community Hall project. And since the great earthquake, I mean, since Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011, he has been playing an important role as an organizer for reconstruction projects in disaster affected areas and contributed to the re to realize some uh, good architecture in the severe front line of reconstruction from disaster, being part of Arcade and receiving, Arcade is the uh, voluntary network of architects to help the reconstruction of the community. And, and uh, uh, he received the, uh, uh, many important design awards. In October, 2018, the Chinese version of his AIJ award book, Pre-Design Thinking of Architecture, uh, was published. And uh, he is now as a chairman of the Architecture Planning Committee of the Architecture Institute of Japan. He's working to improve the architect selection in Japan and to promote the pre-design as a bridge between architecture planning, research, and practice. So please welcome Professor Onoda. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. Uh, thank you for introduction, me, Hitoshi. Uh, I'm very honored. <clears throat> Today, I'm very honored to be here and uh, have a presentation for you. So, can I just use my screen? Maybe this one. Could you see the my slide? Okay. Okay, let me start. Oops. As Hitoshi mentioned to you, uh, my profession is a little bit complicated. Uh, I sort of been a researcher and a designer and uh, the producers. So these three, uh, how can I say, function is my profession. So the issue of today, my uh, today issue of the uh, the presentation of today is a uh, reality and the difficulty of uh, build back better, the perspective from the field. As I mentioned, uh, <laughs> Professor Imamura and Murao, build back better is a my, one of the most important uh, issue for uh, reconstruction, but uh, actually it's very tough work. So before then, please see, oops. So this is a private video of what happened in uh, 2011 the March 11th, the tsunami is coming. He was screaming the uh, almost hell. So this is a tide wave. So tide wave, I uh, can say taking almost all thing on the ground. So very shocking videos. So uh, this is a human loss of uh, uh, by uh, disaster. Uh, 2011. 
so, so many uh, people passed away. And also, there are so many buildings destroyed by tsunami. It's so huge loss. And also, there are so many, many, uh, so huge expense uh, well, by its government. Almost uh, 300 billion dollars in 10 years. And also, this is the size of this affected area uh, from north to south, uh, 500 kilometers. So huge. So uh, this is a photo uh, you know, my, uh, in front of you know, this affected area uh, on the reconstruction the management in Kamaishi, the, around the uh, disaster affected areas. So th this is a diagram of, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, before the disaster. The barrier protected uh, our human life, but uh, the, it's very difficult to, you know, to understand what happened uh, on the barrier. But the disaster destroys almost everything. And uh, the reconstruction work is a, a sort of in a system, very severe system. It, the, that's why the, you know, the uh, bit back bit, how the, uh, that's why the, it's difficult to to reconstruction or is a, a build back better. So this is a stakeholder, this is a diagram of uh, the stakeholders of reconstruction. So the central government and the prefecture office, the local government and the residents, the disaster victims and non-disaster victims. Also private sector is, uh, you know, related. But that unfortunately, the, in central government, there are so many the bureaus, and uh, you know they have different missions, and uh, we don't find a special signification to integrate their one missions. So but, uh, it's a, a so-called partial optimization of upper structure. Also, this is a the different diagram, the flow of the grant and budget. The central government, and uh, this is the municipalities and the communities. But uh, each municipality is very segmented. And uh, also they are chasing the each other to receive the grant. They don't want to share the information. So this is a so-called the partial optimization of robot structure. <laughs> so that's why the Hitoshi and the us uh, uh, coordinate a sort of you know community or network to support uh, reconstruction work to humanize for build back better. So th this is the one. A couple of minutes short, uh, our, our workshop at uh, just uh, two months after the disasters. We had a kind of in field research and uh, hearing and uh, presentation for the victims. After 10 days, in 10 days, the, we coordinated a very, how can I say, huge the report to that is as affected areas. So th this is the one with the result. Uh, it's very uh, you know, beautiful, uh, how can I say, the public housing for the victims. Also with the Hitoshi, we uh, can I say provided a very good uh, uh, circumstance for the victims. And also this is a, uh, uh, one of the uh, good example. But uh, these are very rare cases. Uh, you know, the majority of reconstruction work is not so, uh, how can I say, beautiful, great things. 
they're just uh, you know, reconstructed. So I just, we just, uh, how can I say, published uh, the what's happened uh, in, the front, in front of, you know, or reconstruction uh, from uh, the disaster uh, 2011. But unfortunately, this book in the all description of this book is uh, in in Japanese. So sorry. So right now we are preparing to translate uh, from Japanese to English. So please wait uh, a little bit. So th this is a, a sort of you know grant flow uh, from uh, central government, uh, prefecture, and uh, municipalities. The almost uh, the in the, uh, in the in the reconstruction of uh, you know, from the Great East Japan asking the uh, 2011, almost all money come from you know government as a contradiction. Uh, this is uh, the cash for the uh, in the case of in you know, Hurricane Katrina in uh, 2005. So there are also there are many, uh, you know, much of money from the government, but also uh, NGO or participated uh, the reconstruction works, and uh, also very, uh, you know, huge the money that come from yeah, the insurance. The a sort of you know, money is uh, <clears throat> multi stakeholder the network is working the cash flow, but. Uh, on the other side, uh, the, in the case of you know Japan, the the government almost uh, we also have a uh, you know insurance and uh, they are working, but uh, uh, for reconstruction design work, uh, the almost all money come from the government, the monopolize. That's a, a kind of you know big contrast, uh, <coughs> big contrast between the, our government, our reconstruction work and the other countries' uh, reconstruction work. So let me explain the actual situation of reconstruction. So th this is a basic you know, uh, uh, work to, for the reconstruction. The first, uh, we uh, reconstruct uh, the sea embankment. And the next, uh, we are moving the, uh, the uh, couple, you know, the house uh, from the uh, disaster hazard areas, the relocation, the inland and the elevated ground. And also we, uh, build up the public housing. I already showed you the couple of you know, the things. Also, the, there are so many uh, other projects in you know, reconstruction, reconstruction of you know, river, river uh, re reconstruction of you know, road, and the reconstruction of a you know, couple of the things. Okay, so th this is a, how can I say that basic uh, uh, the frame of uh, uh, the the reconstruction the works. The government, central government, as they <coughs> uh, they uh, they. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they separated uh, two different uh, uh, kind of, you know, the tsunamis. The one is a level one tsunami. It's an estimated interval uh, from 100 year and uh, to uh, 1500 years. And uh, th this is a level two tsunami. Uh, the estimated interval is from one, thousand years to uh, almost uh, 400 years. So this, uh, we, the central government decided the size of you know, sea embankment 
to protect L1 tsunami, level one tsunami, you know, like this. The level, tsunami, level two tsunami is coming, the overcoming the, this sea embankment. Of course, the, you know, the, the, the damage energy of you know, L2 tsunami is bigger than L1 tsunami. So that's why the government you know, decided uh, a disaster uh, hazard areas uh, from here to there. So then the line, this line is very important. How we can estimate the safe zone and the unsafe zone? It's a very difficult to think. So let me explain a couple, you know, the situation. So th th this is a, you know, the, the, uh, the map of, you know, this is affected area, the Tohoku area. The, the same scale, the San Francisco, Los Angeles, the New York City. Uh, it's a sort of in you know, a huge uh, sea, uh, sea coast. So, Ogatsu, Rikuzen, Takada, the Nosumai, they are kind of you know, the different uh, uh, <clears throat> different way of reconstruction. So, the Rikuzen, Takada is a uh, this is a, the, the way of Rikuzen Takada. They are grand rising, they are taking the grand rising the tactics the with uh, the sea embankment. So th th this is a, the, the way of you know, reconstruction in Ongatsu, sea embankment and the relocation of you know, highland. The also we today we uh, I would like to explain the another one the sweet bait and the uh, evacuation facilities. So there are kind of an evacuation facilities created on the uh, hill, and uh, you know they are reconstruction these uh, flat areas. Uh, so let me explain the first tactics, the embankment and the reconstruction, a relocation to higher ground. So Ogatsu, the, the Ogatsu the main village is located at the end of the bay, very, how can you say, deep bay in the Ogatsu. This is a photo before the disaster. It's a very beautiful, the nice bridge. But uh, you know, after uh, this is a photo just after uh, March 11th, almost uh, you know everything is uh, taken away by the tsunami. Uh, so then we are doing the, as a government, central government doing the tsunami simulations. So based on Tohoku University model, the, you know, it's related to very uh, you know, strongly, it's related to the, uh, I can say, the result of Imamura's level or the research. So that's why we are calling Tohoku University models. So th this is a simulation of, yeah. The computer simulation tsunami. So we estimate uh, uh, how deep the L2 tsunami is coming. So basically, uh, we, we can estimate, uh, you know, disaster uh, the, the areas and the safe zone. So in this case, it's not so difficult, you know, reconstruction planning, but a couple of, you know, the areas like this, they are so <laughs> wide areas, uh, you know, it's very danger zone uh, as a result of uh, tsunami simulation. Unfortunately, Ogatsu is uh, this case. 
Yeah, unfortunately, all that fall into this category. Even, uh, you know, the, the end of the bay is a, the energy of tsunami is very strong, very high. So that's why even for uh, anti level one tsunami, we need a huge sea embankment. But the level two tsunami is coming to overcome to level one, such a huge level one uh, sea embankment. Oops. So this is the result, the before and after. So before, as you already see on the uh, <clears throat> slide, this is a before uh, the, the tsunami. This is a central area of the villages, the elementary school, junior high school, and uh, this, this is a governmental, the local governmental office. This is the oldest areas. But uh, after the, our, no, our, after by the governmental uh, reconstruction planning, they created a very huge sea embankment, but uh, on these flat areas, it's very dangerous by level two tsunami. So that's why people can leave only these small the areas. It's a very uh, you know, di difficult decision making. So th th this is the center of you know, the areas. The before oh, like this, but after the, this is a shop and the museum and uh, sort of in you know, offices. Uh, th this is a uh, living areas like this. The, they have to separate. It's very uh, yeah, you know, difficult to live. And uh, let me change to, uh, let me see the, uh, the different tactics. The sea uh, embankment and the grand rising in Rikuzen Takada. So this is a for, uh, map of Rikuzen Takada before you know, the, the disasters. There are two the towns. This is one of the most oldest you know, town in Maizumi. Yeah, it's a very, very beautiful old villages. But uh, after the, the reconstruction, there are fun uh, grandizing these areas. The size of this area is three kilometers. From here to there, the three kilometers. This is a scale. From here to there, three kilometers and uh, one kilometers. They are rising ground uh, almost eight meters. From eight meters to 10 meters, the ground rising. Very high ground rising. Also, the, these beautiful villages, almost all house is relocated the Africa. So that's why this is a ch how change the, uh, you know, center, the villages, uh, not villages, the cities. The, this is the center of the inner city the from here. It's a good kind of end. It's a kind of sort of, you know, we are calling Yamate, the, the mountain. Uh, uh, we are seeing a kind of you know, sideline. But th this, this is a photo the after, th this is a new station. Yeah, this is a photo the after, uh, you know, deconstruction. <laughs> it's very difficult to say uh, how. Uh, also, this is, uh, you know, the photo of you know these areas, yeah, these areas, old, how can I say, the shopping areas. It's very nice. But uh, after, uh, you know, reconstruction, it's it's a sort of you know clean, <laughs> but uh, 
they are very difficult to, to find the, the, the special character of this town. Also, they created a kind of a you know, memorial, the, the museums the here, designed by uh, Hiroshi Naito, or one of the noted Japanese architect, like this. <laughs> very strong axis. <laughs> so, so the, the, this is a reality of you know, reconstruction. So the last one is uh, kind of you know, different uh, the tactics so in Unosmai cities. So this is a photo before the disasters. So beautiful how can I say, beach. And also this is a main town of, you know, uh, uh, downtown of you know, these villages, uh, kind of in the elementary school and the junior high school. And uh, this is uh, the stations, the kind of all the shrines. So this is the water before disaster. Yeah, tsunami coming now and that took away almost everything on the ground. Yeah. So many things, people is passed away. So the, the, this is, a, uh, we collaborated uh, with the local government uh, the reconstruction of this city. These villages. The, the, this is a for, uh, can I say drawing by uh, landscape architect and us. The first we created a kind of an evacuation station uh, built with uh, uh, elementary school and the junior high school. This is a kind of good collaboration between architecture and uh, civil planning. Like this. Also, the, after the the school, we created a kind of in you know, a stadium, a kind of memorial the, the the city in front of you know uh, the stations. This is our photo of uh, you know reconstruction works. Okay, so so th th this is a, how can I say, a physical reconstruction of, uh, uh, by, uh, from the, the disaster uh, 2011. But uh, we are finding the kind of, you know, robustness, that kind of relationship, robustness and resilience. This is the last slide. In Shichigahama city, uh, Shichigahama town, there are kind of, you know, couple of, you know, the different villages. This town is a low resilience. It's very, this town is very difficult to, you know, to reconstruct, how can I say, to re revitalize. Because, uh, you know, after the disaster, they still couldn't have, a, how can I say, summer festival. But that, uh, these the village come easily, how can I say, reconstruct. And also they uh, succeed to have a summer festival the soon, maybe from 2013 or something. After two years, they have, a, a, how can I say, it's the summer festivals. The difference between these low resilience town and uh, high resilience town. The system is, uh, you know, self-governance is very different. They still have a kind of, you know, old system. The one couple of people passed away, but the, the, the kind of, you know, the different people is, uh, can change easy. But the, the, this type very modernized very segmented and separated. So that's why uh, if one people is passed away, it's very difficult to continue, uh, can I say, that kind of you know, things. So that's why very uh, difficult. 
So, so uh, we still studying the how, how can I say, organize this kind of you know, high resilient context with using good architecture. So this is a kind of a challenging project and uh, still, uh, you know, and uh, <clears throat> constructing. So anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Onoda. Um, any questions? Or maybe I should just jump into the fourth speaker today. So Professor Elizabeth Marley is an associate professor at the International Research Institute of Disaster Risk Science, the Hope University. With the theme of people-centered housing recovery, her research interests are community-based housing recovery and temporary transitional and permanent housing provision within the reconstruction, including policy process housing form that supports successful life recovery for disaster affected people. Past and the current research focuses on the experience of people affected by disaster and the role of government and NGOs in the process of housing reconstruction and resettlement after disasters in the USA, Indonesia, Philippines, and Japan. So please welcome uh, Professor Liz Mali. Thank you very much, uh, Hitoshi, for the introduction. And um, yeah, I was I studied architecture in the United States at the University of Washington, and now I've been working in Japan for a while. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can you see the presentation? Let's see, I yes. can't. Yes. Okay. So um, I think, and I think you are now on the West Coast, folks, and. Scotland folks for sure are getting very tired. So um, please, we'll try to uh, keep you awake and then uh, maybe some overlap with the previous presentations, but maybe we can um, think about think about things as we go along. So, and then I think I should, yeah, try, I, I go quickly because I think I have too many slides and a limited time, but I want to talk to you a little bit more about um, post disaster housing reconstruction in Japan after 311 and as you probably are already quite familiar with we are um, folks on the West Coast were all connected by the Pacific rim of fire and Japan has four earth uh, seismic plates where under near or underneath Japan so we have so many experiences with various kinds of natural hazards um, and big disasters and also therefore we have a lot of um, established policies and past examples um, of recovery and 311 basically we can say that 311 really the recovery processes and recovery policies and projects draw on the past ex examples, but even for Japan that has so much experience, it was a really overwhelming um, massive scale event that also changed some things. Um, but before I want to talk about 311, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about the 1995 Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake, or sometimes we just call Kobe earthquake because it hit Kobe, Japan. And that was the first big disaster in Japan after World War II. And so from a housing policy perspective, a lot of the policies, current contemporary modern housing recovery policies in Japan um, can be traced back to what happened after Kobe. Um, and then what happened in Kobe was uh, the, it was an earthquake, but the, the damage was caused also by big fires that broke out and burnt um, for several days, which is a little bit similar to what happened in Tokyo in 1923, um, also similar to what happened in San Francisco in 1906, which is a really interesting um, disaster if anybody's thinking about looking at historical cases near your region. So um, basically Japan's housing recovery policies and response policies have three distinct phases of evacuation and temporary housing and permanent housing. And those temporary housing and permanent housing are gonna appear again um, in later on in the presentation. And, but just to say in this case of Kobe, one of the things that happened was because of the available land and the location of the temporary housing, that really was a disruption for people's lives because they 
basically were located far away from where they lived before. And also they were, um, they moved into temporary housing using a lottery system. So they were scattered around. And that's a, I mean, that's a shared um, challenge for people after di disasters. Um, in many cases, we know about them after Hurricane Katrina, there's a diaspora. So people are get scattered and the uh, recovery for recovery and for people's lives recovery um, that's a really disruptive thing. So we try to keep people together if we can. Um, this is the temporary housing that was built in Kobe and uh, the the construction was prefabricated, um, barrack style housing, mass um, units in, in large locations. And these, these houses were really not really comfortable for the people. They were hot in the summer, they were cold in the winter. They were all the same. Um, some people, there's even examples of people who got lost, not being able to find their own house. And then we have a lot of um, negative emotional and community ties, not only community ties, but also leading to depression and a problem that we have in Japan called solitary death. So we already know these examples of what the impact can be on on communities caused by these kinds of policies. And then in Kobe, the, after the temporary housing, basically the, go, the government, and in Japan, as was already mentioned, um, the government is a very strong actor in housing recovery. So in the United States, we have more NGOs and, and community organizations and private funding, but in Japan, the government is really the main actors. Um, but in the case of Kobe, basically, the government program focused on the building of what is called disaster recovery public housing. And Professor Onoda showed some examples of what that looks like, but um, yeah. And that was also kind of disruptive, uh, caused some challenges for people because they moved into these large scale apartment style buildings that were also far from where they were before. So that's just kind of a little bit of a background of what kind of past examples we had in Japan um, looking back before we experienced 311. So um, as you know now, uh, Japan experiences many earthquakes and these the, the map on the, sorry, it's in Japanese, but the map on the left is the earthquakes that had happened before um, 2011. You can see the dates and the locations. And then the right side is all of the predicted earthquakes. So we um, actually, we just had a, a big earthquake in Tokyo. Uh, yes, uh, two, two days ago, the night before last and magnitude um, six, and then at at night. So people were very concerned that it might be the big big earthquake that we we're expecting um, to hit Tokyo, but it seems to be not the biggest. Um, and we're also expecting another earthquake, big earthquake called the Nankai earthquake or Nankai trough earthquake, which is on the Southern uh, coast of Japan. So, um, 2011 tsunami was a huge event, but it's also not going to be the last massive um, disaster event that we have. Similar to um, in, in, I mean, in California, you're familiar with all of the active fault lines, but also you have the um, Cascadia subduction zone, which could cause a massive tsunami on the all of the West Coast of the United States, especially Washington, Oregon. So with all this history of disasters, even in Japanese uh, culture, there's a popular understanding that earth that popular familiarity with earthquakes and this is a, um, a woodblock print showing well in the past people believed that earthquake is caused by a big catfish while wagging its tail under the ground so this is a picture of people trying to keep the catfish from moving so it's not what we consider um, modern disaster uh, preparation or mitigation but it shows uh, kind of the more mythological um, attitudes of people trying to stop um, disasters from happening. We also have depictions of historic events. This is a historic, uh, this is a print um, of a tsunami in the, also in the Tohoku region. So we have experienced in the same area that experienced 2011, um, we've also experienced massive earthquakes and tsunamis in um, 1896 and in 1933 that happened in the region. And also we were affected by the Chile tsunami. So earthquake in Chile in 1960 also caused a tsunami that hit this region of Tohoku. So this area has experienced multiple tsunamis um, about every you know 30 or 40 years on kind of a regular basis, especially the Northern 
um, part of the area that was affected in 2011. Um, and we also have examples of relocation. That's something I think you've seen in all of the presentations so far. Um, one of the main policies or approaches um, support, also supported by the government is to move people out of the risk area and to move people and residential communities to higher land or inland areas or both. And these maps show some of the past examples. Actually, this is not a new thing after 2011. There were also past examples where um, villages or parts of villages were moved to safer locations after the disaster with the, with at that time, of course, after experiencing the disaster, people feel this is dangerous. This is not a safe place to live. Let's move to a, to a safer area. But after time and after some generations pass, people tend to rebuild in those um, risk areas again. And so we had both examples of areas where um, in, the, in the past communities had relocated to highland areas, but then before um, over time, they had rebuilt again in the low area. And this is a picture of an area where the relocated, the highland area was okay, but everything below had been a, a communities and, and homes um, that was devastated in 2011. And we also have examples where areas, people moved away from the uh, risky areas, and then those areas were preserved as open spaces or um, fields or, or farming areas, and therefore nobody was um, injured or lost their life in 2011. So this, this, this principle of moving away from the risk, I think is really, that really resonates, resonates with whatever kind of risk you're thinking about when you talk about how people's lives um, are affected or how people interact or think about risk or live with, with risk. And I think that's a, that's a really big topic um, for whatever kind of hazard you're looking at as long as, if, if you're thinking about how people live, which as architecture students, you, I'm very sure are. Um, so I won't say too much about the disaster itself. I think you already saw a lot of information from the other presentations, but it's a, just to reiterate, it's a it was a complex disaster, a wide area disaster, including the earthquake and the tsunami and the earth and the nuclear disaster. So that's a kind of um, new, um, we don't have any really examples like that um, in any other place in the world for disasters that had a massive natural hazard event that resulted also in a technological disaster. And both of them are, you know, the earthquake, the tsunami was a vast, affected a vast area and the nuclear disaster was also very severe. And then, comp so they're very complex and also the affected area is very vast. Um, as was already mentioned, it's more than 500 kilometers affected um, causing huge damages for property and housing and also huge disruption for people's lives um, and, and evacuation. And also I think another really important part is we, when we talk about disasters, we also need to always think about what are the contexts of societies that disasters occur in. And disasters always show us the people who were vulnerable before, but maybe we didn't notice. Um, so in the case of Japan, one of the things that, um, one of the important contexts is we are in an aging society. So the population is decreasing and also the number of people, elderly people is growing, um, which causes, and, and the region that was affected in 2011 was aging even faster than Japan as a whole. So that's kind of the background of the areas that were affected and that has implications for um, long-term recovery and sustainability of the region and how these, um, it's really difficult because in the future, the, the population is um, going to continue to decline. And so who's going to take care of these towns? Are there still going to be people living in the reconstructed area? Um, are questions that are really, really hard to, to answer in a confident way. Um, also the geographical context of the affected area in Tohoku, we have a couple different typologies um, overall, and the Rias Coast, and that's one of the, you've also seen examples of those, especially from Professor Onada's presentation. It's a jagged coast, like, um, like the fjords in, in Norway, or the Rias area in Spain, which is where the word Rias comes from, but it's a very jagged um, coastline with narrow 
uh, valleys where rivers meet the ocean. And the result is this very small flat areas of, of buildable land there. And then traditionally fishing villages were located on these little, little coastal areas. And so once we talk about moving away from the coast or relocating away from those places, it's difficult because there's not a lot of um, places to go to uh, nearby unless you start cutting the mountains, which is what happened. Um, on the other hand, where we are in Sendai, which is further south, um, there's a very flat topography. So actually there's no high area to escape to because the ground is so flat. It's very good for riding a bicycle, but not good for finding evacuation place. And, and just to say also, the um, there's also a difference in the experiences of past tsunamis in these areas. So the Rias Coast area, a little bit north, has been hit by many um, disasters over the years, every 30 to 40 years, those tsunamis that I mentioned. But the Sendai Plain area um, doesn't experience disasters on such a regular basis. We also have examples of evacuation. Um, this is a case in Sendai where the school was used as a site for evacuation. And this is a, a good case, a happy case where it was successfully, um, people's lives were saved, um, more than 300 people. Um, evacuated to the roof of the school and they were able to be lifted out by helicopter the next day. Um, and also we have in this town of Kamaishi, a good examples of evacuation where people, where kids um, had practiced how to evacuate and they knew how to make their own decisions and go to an even safer place and they were li their lives were saved. Unfortunately, we also have examples, um, well, this is the only example where kids died at the school, but uh, more than 70 students and teachers lost their lives in this Okawa Elementary School uh, because basically because action wasn't taken quickly to, to escape um, safely. So this, Tsunami causes really devastation. Um, you saw the wave coming in, but um, it really takes it takes everything and leaves this kind of landscape of destruction. And uh, I'm not going to really go into details into policies. I think you already saw very you already um, had a peek at how complex the Japanese reconstruction policies are from Professor Onoda's presentation. Um, so I just want to say, just to want to reiterate that the in the in the biggest red box that the programs and policies after the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 were drawing on the past examples and have some similarity, but were also there's also some new innovations and developments. And if anybody wants to pursue a future career in the study of disaster recovery policy. There's a lot, there's a lot to work on, but we're not gonna talk about that in detail. Um, but in, in Tohoku also, we had the same phases of temporary housing and then permanent housing. And then these are the, some examples of temporary housing. And we also saw some good examples of attempts to make the temporary housing more friendly and more livable using um, wooden materials and local materials and, uh, making nicer spaces around them. And then the bottom right is the example of Shigeru Ban, who built the uh, three-story temporary housing um, in the town of Onagawa. And um, I think you also saw a lot about the relocation and recovery planning, but just another example, this is the town of Minami Sanriku. And oh, I realized I should be playing it like this. And um, the, you can see what the town that existed before, this kind of dense, multi-use um, streets, little, little tiny, you can just see the roofs, but um, it included uh, mixed use housing, residential, commercial um, areas that Onoda Sensei showed us in the street view. And then that's all washed away by the tsunami. And then the relocation areas are the main, one of the main focuses of the planning process to move the residential uses up to highland area, which actually um, separates, winds up separating the uses of the town, um, and I think in, in contemporary um, urban planning for sure, and maybe even in arch your architecture courses, you, you understand the idea of mixed use and vibrant, vibrant communities that include living and working and shops all together. And that's what we had in the past in these regions, but the recovery projects and processes in some area, in some cases, um, separated the uses um, 
further away, requiring more car access, and um, that's another challenge. So some key points of the housing recovery context, just to reiterate, the laws and policies existed before, but the scale of two, 2011 disaster and recovery was also unprecedented. And therefore the national government created um, the National Reconstruction Agency with menus of recovery projects and the local government in Japan, the local government is in charge of um, preparing for the disaster, responding to the disaster and also making their recovery plan and implementing their recovery plan. And in terms of housing recovery, the typical projects that are related to that is first of all, what we call collective relocation for disaster mitigation, which we do not have in the United States. So in the United States, sometimes um, buyout projects are used to acquire land, but the uh, US policy is to buy the land, goodbye. But in Japan, the collective relocation includes two parts. One is designated the designating the risk area as hazardous, which has implications for future construction, but then the residents can sell that land to the government. And part two is the government also provides new lots for people to rebuild on their own, either for sale or for rent the land and in higher areas. And the other main disaster recovery public housing is the other main support for uh, disaster survivors to uh, rebuild their housing. And we also have a lot of land readjustment projects or land raising or mountain cutting. So there's a lot of modification of the landscape. And this is, I think you've already seen similar um, concepts in, in multiple presentations today as well, but we are thinking now, um, this is a big change in the thinking from before 2011, where there was the idea that if you build a big enough defense you can protect against the disaster. But there was a shift in thinking after 2011 because now we understand even if we, whatever we estimate as the risky risk likelihood, there can always be a bigger disaster. So therefore we changed the thinking to keeping the, pre, the physical infrastructure structures to prevent against a smaller disaster or smaller tsunami that may come in 30 years or 50 years or 100 years, but also taking other uh, measures such as land use, relocation, uh, multiple defense structures to mitigate the disaster, um, for a, a massive disaster that may not happen so often, but will be devastating. And I think this is especially Professor Ivan Morris talked about this principle when he was explaining this idea of building back better, especially from the technological um, and engineering point of view, it includes this kind of expansion of what we consider for mitigation strategies. Um, in very oversimplification, um, it results in these two kinds of ways to move people out of the inundation risk area, out of the tsunami risk area, and into higher ground, which is done either by cutting into the mountains or filling up based on um, the local context. And if you want to understand more uh, detailed processes of collective relocation, I recommend this um, chapter that's written by our colleague, Professor Ubauda, about how it works in, in more detail, because actually there's multiple detailed projects that, that are related to this um, ways of relocating houses away from the risk area. But it's basically, um, yeah, it's all, Basically the same approach was just to move housing away from the area that could have a tsunami. And there's a lot of reliance on infrastructure. Even if we talk about multiple strategies, there's still a real um, emphasis on building infrastructure. And this was also the town, um, Professor Onoda talked about the Rikuzen Takada that used to have the two communities and that he mentioned this was a very uh, nice traditional old uh, community on the side of the river. So it's very massive land raising, very massive um, modification of the landscape, cutting into the mountains to create these new places. And these are some of the examples of new land areas that are um, new residential lots that are provided as part of these projects. And then people can rent or buy those lots and then rebuild 
um, in this way. It's very typical to standard suburban development that you would see in other parts um, outside of big cities in, in Tokyo, in, in Japan now. Uh, the other kind of housing that's provided is uh, disaster recovery public housing, which includes both multifamily apartment buildings, but also single family detached housing, which I think is unique to Japan um, to provide single family housing as um, disaster recovery public housing. And all public housing in Japan is government subsidied um, rent sensitive housing, although the rent um, subsidy changed a bit after, after 10 years. So um, some of the key challenges are these, these projects that really focus on large scale infrastructure and really changing the landscape and townscape and it, which causes changes for the communities. So recovering um, not only the physical structures but also the community connections and businesses and especially this is a fishing area. And so there's a lot of um, uh, challenges related to the livelihood recovery and life recovery and community recovery. And we talked about the challenges for the future and questions of long-term sustainability. Um, I think we are almost out of time. So I have another um, section about the Fukushima disaster aspect of 311. So I think I just go through very quickly in just a few, maybe just a few minutes um, to hit some key points about that. Uh, one of the key points is that Unlike, so these, the, the majorly affected prefectures are Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima. And unlike Iwate and Miyagi that had most of the damage caused by the tsunami, Fukushima also had a tsunami, but it also of course had the uh, disaster of the nuclear power plant meltdown, which caused people to evacuate um, far away outside of their prefecture and also it led to a lot of what we call indirect death. So people who died not from being directly affected by the tsunami or the earthquake, but from some result of the difficulties of evacuation or the secondary impacts of the disaster, which is something we really need to pay attention to a lot. Um, this is the location of the area around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And the uh, basically, the evacuation areas were established and then um, the areas were designated as, as several different levels. They have a difficult to return zone, which means um, it's actually questionable when that area could ever be um, able to be inhabited again. And then other, other, levels of, um, other levels of evacuation based on the measurement of radioactive contamination. And those zones I, I will not talk about the details, but those zones were established and then revised uh, multiple times over time. Um, you can see the dates when the zones were list, lifted, and that has other implications for people, um, their compensation that they're that they're allowed to get. And um, of course, it's a really difficult situation for people. Every disaster experience is difficult, but it's extra difficulty if your hometown is destroyed and you can't even go back to that place where um, you, you know, you grew up or your ancestors live for multiple generations or your, your former, um, your house and your family and all of your memories are there. So this loss of the hometown is another level that's really difficult to address with um, recovery policies, um, but they're, Many things are happening, but we will not talk about the details. And then um, in general, the challenge of evacuation is that even if the evacuation order is lifted, many people don't want to come back to that place. So there are some areas where only you know, less than 10%, only 8% or 6% of the former residents come back. So the recovery planning and the recovery projects are dealing with both um, and those local local mayors are dealing with both how to support their residents who keep living out of the town and also how to rebuild their town um, that people are not, are not coming back to. So it's really, really complicated. Um, yeah, I'll just keep going through here. And then, and then of course people are living outside of their hometown and we have challenges of um, decontamination and we can't really uh, de can't decontaminate all areas. So even if you scrape off all the soil in the area around the house or the area around the school, you can't really decontaminate the whole woods or the whole um, forest or the whole um, ecosystem. So it's 
that's another challenge. So yeah, I'm, I think, uh, yeah, we talk, this is a little bit theoretical, but we talk about wicked problems for the problems that there's no answer to. So we just try to do the best that we can. Um, and I think that the um, issue of Fukushima and the recovery is falls into this category. So yeah, so just finally for housing reconstruction um, everywhere or anywhere to be people-centered, what we really need is housing that meets people's needs and involvement of local residents in the process and equitable reconstruction is really tricky, but it's um, important to always think about addressing the, the needs of people, of what they are, um, and, and additional assistance as necessary. So um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for our kind of rushing. Um, okay, so um, I wonder if there's any questions that you guys would like to ask or if you have any questions please raise your hand okay 